good and holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Everybody in the room would say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, welcome to The Way. You know who I am. And so for those of you who are joining us online, I am Brad, the teaching elder here at The Way. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5 this morning as we finish we're finishing 1 John after uh, three months, and uh, I hope you have been uh, as edified as a, through the study as, as I have, and I don't think that I've mastered 1 John by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but I certainly feel like uh, I have a much greater grasp of 1 John, and so uh, again, I hope that you have been edified by this study as well, and uh, Hey, just a couple of prayer requests. If you have your pens and a couple of things to write down, I wanted to get them out before I forget. So, uh, Miss Cindy is having surgery, or she had surgery this last week, and she's out this morning. And you know if Cindy's missing church, you know it's a thing. So, she's probably not feeling well this morning. So, please keep Cindy in your prayers. Dr. Rudy made it to Afghanistan. He's there. We can start the countdown clock. Uh, until we get him back in the fold here. So uh, pray for Dr. Rudy and Miss Lee back here holding the rope uh, as he is over there in a dark land doing the nation's business. And uh, Bradley is still over there. Uh, they're not on the same base, I don't think, so I don't think they'll get to have any fellowship. Uh, who knows, Lord, they put them together, uh, but I don't think they're going to be. But uh, definitely put Bradley and, and Anna, keep them in your prayers as well. Uh, as we as we hold the rope back here for them. So First John chapter five. So Scott uh, preached a great message last week from First John chapter five verses one through five uh, that I was intensely edified by, talking about faith from start to finish. Uh, the source of our faith is regeneration; that it that it comes from God; that it's not anything that we do, anything that we obtain or seek to get. That God has gifted us with our faith via regeneration. He talked about the fruit of our faith is loving obedience. That because of our faith and because of the love that that we have in our regenerated hearts for the Lord, we seek to obey Him. And then uh, and then he he talked about the the result of our faith or the end of our faith is victory. Victory. And what an amazing thought that is. I want to talk about that victory a little bit today as we seek to land the plane that is 1 John. So, uncertainty, uncertainty is the enemy of faith. Uncertainty is the enemy of faith. Now, I don't know, there's some, there's some, maybe some disagreement as to what the first sin was. We go back to the garden, and you can make an argument that the first sin was maybe apathy or fear as the man stood by and allowed the serpent to confront the woman. You know, you can make some arguments about what the first sin actually was. But there is no argument about what the first angle that Satan attempted to leverage in seeking to tempt men to sin. God had spoken clearly. Genesis chapter 2. He had spoken very clearly to the man who taught the woman. He said, this is my way. Live this way. And the first thing Satan says is, did God really say? He seeks to, he seeks to induce uncertainty into the mind and the heart of the woman and the man by bringing doubt upon what God had said. Now, we live in an age of uncertainty today where there are all sorts of voices and people, some intentional, some not intentional, seeking to inject uncertainty and doubt into our minds and our hearts as to what God has said. They seek to inject uncertainty, which will lead to doubt. At some point, it will generate fear. If we don't have the solid foundation of God's word to lead us and guide us, we will be in fear of eventually hesitation. People are paralyzed by hesitation. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. They don't know who to listen to, who to trust. There's all these different people seeking to inject uncertainty into our minds. We become mired in ambiguity. And the end state of this is spiritual mediocrity. Spiritual mediocrity. God calls us to act 
boldly, to move decisively. And if we are mired in ambiguity, if we are wracked by uncertainty and doubt, how could we ever move boldly and decisively on behalf of the risen Lord Jesus? We see much of a similar condition in John's day as he's writing this letter. There's all these different people saying all these different things. You have the Roman government telling the Christians in those days, hey, uh, you, can, you can worship Jesus, just worship Caesar first. You can worship Jesus, just make sure you worship Caesar first. You had Jewish Christians, some of these folks coming in, Judaizers, who were telling the believers, hey, Jesus, yes, but you also have to be circumcised. You have to do these other things as well. You had uh, early heretics in those days teaching things about Jesus, and some of these things are very nuanced. They're very tough to tell the difference between what's real and what's legitimate. And John himself talks in 1 John chapter 2 about these antichrists. There were people who were in the church. They were of the church. They were part of the fellowship and they left the fellowship, but they weren't just content to leave the fellowship. At some point they, they felt the need, they felt led to deceive the people about who Jesus was. This is the Antichrist. These are spirits of Antichrist that John talks about. And all these different people say all these different things about Jesus. And at some point the people just say, well, who knows? Who knows what could possibly be true? Well, John answers this question in a very decisive way when he says that we know. The answer to the question, who knows, is that we know. What do we know? Well, John tells us why he's writing the letter, this letter in a couple of different places. There's a reason you write a letter. Nobody writes a letter for no reason, right? So this is occasional. There is a reason, and he tells us. He doesn't keep us guessing. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, he says, we are writing these things. So that our joy may be complete. Our joy needs to be complete. There's something missing. And so John is led by the Holy Spirit to write this letter so that our joy can be complete. Chapter 2, verse 1. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. God, John, God, through John, communicates to us that his desire is that we not sin. And he seeks to equip us to do exactly that. Chapter 3, verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. He wants us to be able to discern what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false. And so he seeks to equip us to do that. And then in chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know he does not desire us to, to live in this condition of ambiguity, of guessing, of, of wishy-washiness where we just don't know what is true. He says, I am writing so that you may know. He tells us throughout the letter, he desires us to walk in purity, to walk in love, to walk in boldness, to walk in confidence, to walk in discernment. And then he gets to the very end of this passage of this letter and he makes some proclamations. He makes three bold proclamations. And I pray that today would be a day of proclamation that we would make publicly, that we would make in our hearts. And I want to talk about these proclamations he makes. And I want to listen to the language that he uses. He doesn't use ambiguous language, wishy-washy language. He doesn't say, we think that. He doesn't think, he doesn't say, well, it could be. He doesn't say, well, it's, it's possible that or likely that this may be. No, listen to what he says in verse 18. And there's three of these. And we're going to talk about every one of these. Verse 18, he says, we know, we know, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. So the first thing we're going to talk about <clears throat> is the relationship between the believer and sin. He says, we know that whoever is born of God does not keep on sinning. So we're going to put our, our Bible translation uh, nerd hats on here for just a minute. So bear with me. Because words matter, right? Language matters. How things are said actually matters. Some of your translations speak a little bit differently when you read verse 18. Uh, the NIV, in my preferred translation, the ESV, says, We know that anyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Every single other modern translation says, We know that those who are born of God do not sin. 
They do not sin, or they sin not, or some variation of that. Now, those are different sounding phrases, right? I don't keep on sinning, or I don't sin. One sounds very decisive, and, and, and my two favorite translations, the ESV and the MS, NASV, say different. They speak differently, and I'm, I'm studying this passage, and I'm like, well, well, what is going on here with this passage? Well, again, we're going to put our, 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 our grammar uh, nerve hats on here just a little bit to determine what is the appropriate rendering of that verse. So the, the Greek word is hamartane. That is a third-person present indicative active verb. Third person singular present indicative active verb. And so you all know what that means, and so we'll just we'll call it good. Everybody good? We got that? I tutor Latin to homeschool kids on Tuesdays, so I actually know what that means. <laughs> I mean, uh, and so that actually means something to me. Maybe you do Latin or, or something like that, but I happen to know that. And what that means is if you were to pull this verse and just say, here's the verse, the most appropriate translation would be sins. It's a third person, singular, present, indicative, active verb. The, the most appropriate rendering is sins. Whoever is born of God sins not or does not sin. They don't sin. That is the most appropriate rendering of that text. If you were just to, to pull it out of the, of the chapter here and say, hey, hey here's this verse, and, and you were translated. But we also know... That context is key when we translate and interpret biblical passages. So why on earth does the ESV render this verse, keep on sinning, as opposed to sins? That's an interesting thing to do. Why would they do that? Well, so we know that context is key, so we can never pull a verse out of its context and, and, and just read it unto itself. We've got to read it in, in context of the surrounding verses, the chapter, the book, and even the entire body of Scripture to determine exactly what it means. And it does have a meaning, a verse can never mean what it never meant. A verse has a meaning, a specified intent given of the Holy Spirit communicated through the author writing it, writing it down. So it does have a meaning. So let me give you some other verses here from the, from the same letter. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. One verse later he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's an interesting verse to say. Chapter 2, verse 1. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Listen to chapter 3, verse 9. He says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And then we get to our verse today in chapter 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning or sin. So it's clear from the text that an appropriate rendering of this passage by the ESV is to keep on sinning. There's two extremes, right? And John is refuting either one of those extremes. The idea that once I become a Christian, I can live in sinless perfection. We see from the context that that is not the case. That is not what John is trying to communicate here. However, there are those... There are those who would seek to apply that rendering to this verse. That if you are of Christ, it is possible to attain a level of sinlessness. Or at least willful sin or conscious sin. But at the same time, he seeks to deny the opposite as well. It's not like, well, it's okay just to sin a little bit. You know, I mean, it's okay. We'll just, I mean, we expect you to sin some. And so just don't worry about it that much. If you do, those are the two opposite extremes of the language here. But what John is really trying to communicate to us through this singular passage is that it is out of character for a believer to sin. It is out of character. You have to actively deny who you are to sin if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus. Think about it. We've been born again. God, Scott preached about last week that through the supernatural act of regeneration, God has reached down and he's, he's removed our heart of stone and replaced it with the heart of flesh that we may believe. He's, he's made me a new creation in Christ. All things have been made new in my life. 
life and I have a new character, I have a new nature, I have a new will, I have new desires. And so to sin is to violate my new character. Think about it. John tells us that all sin is lawlessness. Well, what has God done when he regenerated me? But take his very law and write it upon my heart. Once you have been saved, his law has been tattooed across your heart. And so you have to deny your new nature, your heart, your very being when you sin. I like what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If I can get there. Chapter 5, verse 5, he says, For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or darkness. You are of the day. Think about it. As we walk in the light, as John tells us to do, he's empowered us with the Holy Spirit. He's indwelled us with the Holy Spirit to equip us to walk in the light. He's empowered us with the gifts of the Spirit to edify the church up around us. We edify the church up around us and we walk arm in arm with our brothers and sisters in Christ, pursuing Christ, living lives of purity and holiness. We belong to the light. We are of the light. That is where we belong. And to sin is to deny where we belong. I got a confession to make. And so if my wife was here, she was up all night with the little guy or her radar would go, oh gosh, what's he going to say now? I used to cuss. I don't know if anybody here used to cuss, but I did. I used to cuss. I had very foul language. I grew up in a cussing home. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else grew up in a cussing home. Uh, and my father was many things. He, he was a great man in many ways, but he was a, he was a tremendous cusser. Uh, I mean, he was, he was a great man of foul language. And so my family cussed. And I mean, now there were, there were certain words that were fenced off, and these are the really bad words, but uh, you know, these ones are okay to say. And so I grew up as a cusser. And then I joined the military, which is kind of like the graduate school for cussing. And for, for many years, I was surrounded by, by great men of filthy language. Uh, I still recall my very first first sergeant. I mean, he, he was just a, a tremendous cusser. He was like, uh, he had like his doctorate in, in foul language. And, uh, and I adopted that. And my, my cussing game elevated over the years. My filthy language, it just, I took it to a new level. Something funny happened. Uh, just just short of halfway through my military career, the Lord changed my heart. The Lord saved me. He made me a new creation. And all of a sudden, foul language seemed to be really strange coming out of my mouth. I didn't take the Lord's name in vain anymore. I didn't blaspheme and use the Lord's name as a cuss word. And I'd like to say that it was instantaneous. The second that I was saved, I, I never cussed again. But what I will tell you is that foul language began to just feel out of character for me. And at some point, I didn't even like to hear it. I, di I didn't even like to hear foul language. And it was in, so my kids were always trying to catch me in, in a cuss word, you know, if I drop something on my foot or something. And, uh, you know, I sat at my desk working on this message the other night. And, and this is a, I don't know why I did this, but I was like, I wonder if I could cuss. It's just me and God here. And so I sat there for a minute and I thought of some of the filthy words I used to say with, with striking regularity. And I tried to will myself to say a cuss word at my desk, by myself, at night, nobody but me and God. I couldn't do it. I could not say aloud a filthy word, a, 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 a cuss word, because that is not who my character is anymore. I have a new character now, and that is not in my character. To sin is to deny who we are, is to deny our very nature now. But what is astonishing, though, what is astonishing is, is that we do exactly that on occasion, right? Isn't that the astonishing thing? That, that at some point, again, we're, we're empowered in the Holy Spirit. We're marching, following God. we we got the church around us. You know, and, and I see the darkness, and, and for that second, I want to yield to the darkness, to the old man. And I, I step toward, but my friends, they jerk me back and say, whoa, don't go that way. That, that's, that's sin. But at some point, I suppress the voice of the Holy Spirit. I, I quench the Holy Spirit. I grieve the
the Holy Spirit and I rip myself away from my brothers and sisters in Christ and I kick them away and I fight through the crowd to the darkness just so I can get into the sin. It's like I'm swimming upstream to sin. That is what it is like to sin as a believer. I have to actively seek to deny that who I actually am. Isn't that an interesting thing that we still do that? But here's the point. Here's, and, and it's not that it's okay. Sin, we have to understand, is an affront against a holy and righteous God. All sin. All sin. You might sin against your brother, against your sister, against your spouse. It is a sin against a holy and righteous God. But as we go, we will find ourselves, as we are conformed to the image of God, as we are sanctified, as we come to embrace who we really are, it will become more and more out of character to sin. It will become harder and harder to sin. When I think about, you know, back to my language, right after I was saved, you know, some cuss words would come out periodically and I would catch myself. But now to where I can't even make myself do that, not as if I'm testing the Lord, but it was just interesting to see. And so I have to actively oppose who I am to sin. And so what is my option? How do I not sin but to yield? What if I yielded to who God has made me to be? I crucify the flesh daily. I mortify the flesh by the Spirit, by the Spirit of God. Now, you cannot sin of your own willpower. That's possible. Uh, you know, again, we got a lot of military folks here, men of iron will, who can accomplish anything, right? So you can accomplish anything for a period of time. You cannot do something for a period of time. So you can seek to not sin of your own will, but you will fail. You will fail. I promise you that at some point you will fail. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 19, chapter 12, chapter 19, verses 12 and 13. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, who can discern his errors? How do I know what's right and wrong? Teach me, God. How do I know what is right from wrong? Declare me innocent from hidden Faults. Allow me to find the sins that are unintentional in my life. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. God, don't let me sin of my own will, of my own volition. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And only then will I do that. And so again, to sin, we see in verse 18, is a declaration that we are violating our our very character in Christ. What is the encouragement we take from that? What is, what is the encouragement we take in making that proclamation, that declaration that we know these things? Well, one, all of us sin, right? Uh, maybe some of you sin this morning. Some of you will sin today. We'll all probably sin today. Some of you may be caught in habitual sin. Some of you may have struggled with a sin for years. There are church members in this body that have struggled with a particular thing for years, for as long as they can remember. But what this text tells us is that you cannot keep on sinning. You will stop. At some point, your character, the character that Christ has given you, will overwhelm you to the the point that, that the filthy language coming out of your mouth will, see, will feel so out of place, you won't be able to make yourself do it. And it's the same for any other kind of sin as you will yield to that character. And so we know, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. That's encouragement to me. That at some point, I will be purified. You know, we all have a struggle of some kind. I have my own particular struggles. But they are fading away. They are going away. I will be cleared of them at some point in time. And I don't know about you, but that is a tremendous encouragement to me. We know this. We know this. We don't think this. We know this. We know, verse 19, we know that we are from God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. This was kind of tough. So there's a dichotomy that exists, a division defined from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 9, when God tells us that his portion, his portion is his people. The portion of the Lord is his people. There's the division. There is the people of God. And then there's everyone and everything else. There's the people of God, and then there's everyone and everything else. Now, we don't know who the people of God or the potential people of God are, but there's some ramifications 
of this particular text. The first one is, is that we can never be satisfied in this world. We can have peace. We can have joy. God has given us those things, but we are resident aliens in this world. This is a broken and sinful world, and we're surrounded by people who hate God and hate the people of God, so we can never have true satisfaction this side of glory. But let's talk about all of these other people who exist, people you know, family members, maybe people that you love. Listen to what the Word of God says about them. Jesus says in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus tells us, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, Jesus and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Listen to what Paul tells us about these folks in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul tells us, in their case, the God of this world, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of, the Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 as he talks about the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So coupled with John's passage, what this tells us is that if you are not part of God's portion, his people, you are of Satan. You are of the prince of the power of the air. You're the God of this world. What is the implication of this? You probably know a good dude, right? You probably know a guy that you would characterize as a good dude. I, I, I served nearly 23 years in the army, and I was surrounded by good dudes. I mean, some of the best men I've ever known. Patriots. Good men. I joined the regiment out here and I was surrounded by some of the best men, the finest men I've ever known and been a part of, had the privilege to know. Men who fought for country, who sacrificed their lives for this nation. I think about the greatest soldier I ever served with a number of years ago. I served with a man. This guy was one of the best soldiers. He was the finest soldier I ever served with. He was a good family man. He loved his wife. I mean, he, he cherished his wife, and his wife loved him. His wife had had a, a child that was of a previous uh, relationship she'd been abandoned with, so he took this child, and he adopted it and raised it as his own, and had another child that he read that he loved his children he loved his wife he was a good committed family man i never saw him one time step outside of his family and, and he was a great soldier he loved soldiers and he never asked his soldiers to do anything that he would not do himself he was cool and calm and collected under fire he was intensely competent he could make anything happen he could motivate soldiers to accomplish any mission he was the greatest soldiers i've ever greatest soldier i've ever known and one of the best men i've I've ever known and not once to my eternal shame did I ever tell this man about the risen Lord Jesus because he was a good dude he was a good guy you know it's easy right if it's somebody who's overtly wicked right I mean that makes it easy you know the the woman that I saw about on in the news who was bragging about like her 19th abortion Proclaiming that that's obviously wicked that lady obviously needs Jesus The men who pervade per, you know parade their sexual perversion around and acclaim it as virtue That's obvious wickedness obviously evil. They need Jesus We look at that and we see this but what about the good news? What about the guy that everything tells you is a man of respect that this is a good guy. This makes it hard because scripture tells us that you are either of Christ or you are of the devil. You're one or the other. There's nothing in between. There's no middle ground. And it doesn't matter how good this dude is. He's one or the other. And when you look at scripture, what this verse tells us is that there are no good dudes. There are no good dudes. It doesn't matter how good he is. It doesn't matter how good of a soldier he is. It doesn't matter how good of a family man it is. It doesn't matter how well he do, does his job, how confident he is. There are no good dudes. But how many times do we, guilty as charged, look at a man who is a good dude and we deny what we know to be true and we don't share the gospel of the Lord?
of Jesus Christ with this guy. God would never judge this guy. Look at what a, what a, what a good guy this guy is. We deny what we know to be true. Ladies, young ladies, the people that we enter into relationships with. I had a, one of my daughters was in a relationship a year or two ago with, with a young man and pretty good guy. Seemed like it. Not a believer, but as it was informed to me, this guy was not against God. He was supportive of my daughter's active expression of her faith. You know, he, he was in favor of that. He was supportive in that nature. And I thought about that. At one point, my daughter and I, we had a very difficult but good and pointed conversation. It was like, look, it doesn't matter what this guy says. It doesn't matter how supportive he may seem. You and he don't have the same father. At some point, at some level, he's a hater of God. And by extension, he is a hater <coughs> of you. He's not the same as you. And so, young ladies, we have no business entering into relationships with a young man who is not, does not have the same father as you. Because chapter 3, verse 13, and 1 John tells us, chapter 3, verse 13, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. The world, under the power of the prince of this air, of this world, hates you. Hates the very essence of you. But we can take comfort. We can take comfort. There's an encouragement here. Listen to chapter 2, verse 17 of 1 John. Verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Chapter 5, verse 4. Everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. This is the encouragement that we take from verse 19, that, that we are of God's portion. We are his people. And that the world is passing away. All of the, When we look at all of the wickedness and the evil and the pervasiveness of that in this world, and, and it seems like, like, like the church is just fading into irrelevance, fading into obstacles obscurity, that the encouragement we have is that that condition will end. That condition will end. And God will return. Jesus will return. And he will set all things right. And the march of evil will cease. And this is something that we know. We know this. We don't think this. We don't, we don't believe this to be true. We know this to be true because God will affirms it through John to us. And the last thing we know, verse 20 of chapter 5, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. We know truth. We know truth. We know him who is true. He has given us that understanding. There is a full-out assault upon truth in our culture today. There's an assault upon the very idea of of truth, that there even is truth. The idea of, of absolute truth is antiquated, it's, it's outdated, it, it's an old concept, it's, it's not a modern concept in our postmodern society, and we see this everywhere, we see it in people denying the very essence of who they are, denying their gender, that's like last year, two years ago, there's people denying their age, you know, there's grown men dressing up as, as infants because they're denying their very age, there are people denying that they're healthy, you know, I feel like I am, I feel Feel like I am a, a, an amputee, and that our society is actually this, this is happening in Canada, just over the border. Our society is affirming these types of denials and saying, "Well, we will fund via taxpayer dollars an amputation so that your your outer existence can match your inner existence." There's a full out assault upon truth. But we know the truth, the Christian, the believer. We have a corner on the market of truth. We know what the truth is. We know it. We don't think it. We don't, we don't just imagine it to be. It's not a possibility. We know what the truth is. And the truth, the truth is that God loved us so much that he sent his son to take our punishment on the cross for our sins. That is the truth. And here's one last truth I want to leave you with as we make a proclamation today. As we join with John, as we conclude our study through the book of 1 John in affirming things that we know. I said this scripture last night as we were worshiping in the Malloy's house. It's my current favorite scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. He says, or verse 14. For by a single offering... 
He has perfected for all time those who are being sacrificed by a single offering. When Christ declared from the cross, it is finished. All work was done. All work was done. There is nothing else that needs to be accomplished. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to accomplish anything. You don't have to obtain anything. You don't have to seek after anything. Every single thing that has happened since then is a direct result of fallout from the single offering that has perfected you for all time. You are not perfect. You are perfected. That's who you are. And so my, my prayer today, my prayer today is that this would be a day of proclamation. That each and every single one of us would proclaim in our hearts that which we know to be true. That we would proclaim that it's out of our character to sin. That we would yield. We would yield to our new nature, to who God has made us to be. That we would, we would proclaim the knowledge that we are not of this world. We are set apart for the risen Lord Jesus. That we would proclaim that we know truth. What is it that you need to proclaim today that we would affirm these things in our mind, that we would eliminate uncertainty and doubt and ambiguity and fear, and that we would move boldly and decisively based upon the things that we know. <coughs> we don't have to wonder. We don't have to exist in a condition of uncertainty. We know these things to be true. So what do you need to affirm in your heart, in your mind today as we conclude perfected our study through first John. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just love you and we praise you. And God, we proclaim your promises, your statements, your word here today. God, we affirm the knowledge you have given to 